Uh, thank you guys so much for coming to the Atlanta slash Alpharetta Barbell Medicine Seminar. Really appreciate it. Uh, if you have to leave in the middle of this, we understand. Uh, make sure you guys get your certificates on the way out if you haven't already gotten them. Uh, if we don't get to your question, it's actually Austin's fault. I had no nothing to do with curating these questions, so direct all hate-related mail to him. Yeah, come at me. Yeah, his address. Uh, is <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So these are questions submitted by the attendees of our seminar, uh, and we're going to try to try to answer them. Okay, here we go. Uh, if you have an athlete that has popping and clicking at the knee joint with squatting uh, associated with pain and swelling, what do? Uh, would you even consider the popping an issue? Would you be first trying to change the stance or knee position to stop the popping, or would you just adjust load, add tempo, et cetera, and assume the popping is fine? Uh, do you, you want to start? Sure. Okay. Yeah, this question is getting at uh, the, what we call crepitus, and I think the author of this question had read our article on it, but it's a, something that we actually get questions on pretty often. So we do have an article on the website that discusses crepitus. If you just look up barbell medicine crepitus, that will pop up for you. That is not necessarily the aspect of this question that really gets my attention or that would on its own prompt training modifications for me. The question did describe a scenario where somebody has this popping and clicking but associated pain and swelling. So the pain and swelling is more so where I would pay attention to that and be experimenting and adjusting with the training. I would not necessarily be aiming to do something to either the way the person moves or to their programming with the goal of making the popping go away. That is unlikely to actually ever happen. Um, and it's not, that itself is not necessarily pathologic, but in the context of somebody with knee pain and swelling, this sounds like a description of run of the mill osteoarthritis. And so I'm more so aiming to find a training dose and formulation to include their exercise selection and intensity and things like that, that mitigate the symptoms of pain and swelling. And that would be definitely my focus. And I would be as hard as it can be for some folks, trying to pull attention away from the snapping and popping and trying to find something that is more tolerable for them from the, the pain and swelling yeah. aspect. Yeah, I'm pretty much unconcerned with the noises that a person's body makes or my makes, mind makes during training outside of any sort of abnormal experience with respect to pain, swelling in this case, or other uh, dysfunction. But as far as like, my joints are making noise, what do? It's like, uh, ignore it, yeah. Uh, unless it's causing some other sort of issue. And uh, it is funny, I don't know if you remember, I mean, we used to train together in the House of Gains, mm -hmm. the original. And it was sometimes pretty quiet in there. It was like a cacophony of sounds, yeah. just us like warming up between the like dad noises and like <laughs> crepitus, get under the bar. It's like, <sighs> but I just think we're just using all of that whatever is in there as stuff to rebound off off the bottom of a squat. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be doing something. Yeah. Performance enhancing, enhancing osteophytes. That's right. Yes. yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Great. Yes. <laughs> Acoustically pleasing. Yes. Yeah. All right. Austin had mentioned inflammation being one of the contributing factors to anabolic stimuli. Can you comment on anti-inflammatory diets as a way of managing inflammation that people without a chronic medical... Dude, I can't read that. Okay. Yeah, the people without a chronic medical condition claim to have. So these are people talking about anti-inflammatory diets uh, outside of the context of some sort of... Chronic actual inflammatory, inflammatory medical disease. Yeah, and that there are benefits to that. I mean, that's true. Like you said here, the uh, dietary inflammatory index, this is a way that you can actually measure the inflammatory potential of somebody's dietary pattern. And no surprise that ultra processed foods, foods with a ton of added sodium, added saturated fat, added sugar, for example, tend to be very inflammatory or pro-inflammatory uh, with respect to dietary pattern overall. And so if you had less processed foods in general, more fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, high, high dietary fiber, et cetera, those would tend to lower the inflammatory potential of somebody's dietary pattern. Similarly, if people are eating less calories, that seems to lower the inflammatory potential of the diet, uh, in particular if it meets their energy needs. So all of those things would tend to improve outcomes uh, with respect to like their health trajectory. Uh, but as far as like, how does that contribute to anabolic resistance? It's like, that's probably not the first change I would make for somebody with overt anabolic resistance. Yeah. You agree with that? Yeah, um, I think the, the person who asked this question hopefully was, was grasping that the inflammation was kind of on the catabolic side of, of things and, and tends to promote anabolic resistance. But all of that is relatively speaking separate from, from this. That's more, um, more significant 
chronic inflammation that we see in people with these chronic organ system diseases, chronic infections, autoimmune disease, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, you know, heart failure, things like that. All of the end stages of those conditions can manifest with cachexia, basically loss of substantial amounts of muscle mass and fat mass and just kind of wasting syndromes. Mm -hmm. That's very separate from situations where people without a chronic medical condition like that, um, to the extent that they claim to have inflammation, I kind of question that. Um, certainly with people who have excess visceral adiposity and, and, and things like that and obesity, there can be some element of inflammation with that, but it's not anywhere near to the same degree as those medical conditions. And the reason why we didn't talk about things like inflammation due to certain dietary components or this dietary inflammatory index, which now we're bringing up as a real thing that's been studied, validated. Our friends at Sigma Nutrition actually did a podcast with the, uh, the guy who came up with it, um, is that our dietary recommendations are effectively the same as what would be recommended through the paradigm of the dietary inflammatory index. All the things that we recommended as far as shifting towards a more health promoting dietary pattern, all that stuff will also fit that model. Generally tend to lower inflammation to the extent it's, it's an issue. Although the benefits of such a dietary pattern are probably numerous and multifactorial through mechanisms separate from in inflammation as well. Yep. Probably a bunch of different ways that that kind of a diet helps to some extent, maybe through this inflammatory mechanism and then through a bunch of non-inflammatory sorts of things. So it doesn't really change the way that we advise people as far as their diets go. Um, and so we know that it reduces cardiovascular mortality and, and all sorts of other morbidity and things like that. So we recommend eating that way for various reasons to include and independent from the dietary inflammatory index. Yeah, well, and the other part here is like, you, the whole point is like, does this contribute to like anabolic resistance and like, how do I maximize gains? Should I do that by reducing inflammation? And it's like, yo, exercise is pro-inflammatory while you're doing it, right? And if you're not lifting weights and causing that inflammation to occur while you're lifting weights, guess what? Like you're not gonna grow. Uh, so like exercise is pro-inflammatory while you're doing it. After exercise is over, it tends to be anti-inflammatory due to hormones released from the muscle itself. Um, and so I would overall view this as like, don't be afraid of inflammation just in general. Uh, and then if you're eating a health promoting dietary pattern, you're actually resistance training and you don't actually have some medical condition that's causing you to be very resistant to anabolic uh, stimuli, which you would know yeah. general wasting, uh, probably, I probably wouldn't give a second thought to inflammation overall. Spend that time having fun or something. Not, yeah. not worrying about. Or just not stuff. thinking, yeah. <laughs> yep, I like that. Do you think we as clinicians, I wonder who wrote this, do you think we as clinicians should try to maximize the placebo effect in our interventions? You know, this assumes that you have like a good uh, uh, sort of estimation of the percentage pi by which a particular treatment effect is due to the placebo effect. Potentially. Yeah, I, I mean, my view on this is yes, to the extent you know that to be the case, but also by the same token, minimizing like potential nocebo effects. And I don't think you do that via omission. I think you do that through education to the and extent caref careful use of your language and things like that. There's actually a paper by this very title. It's called like titled Maximize uh, Placebo, Minimize Nocebo. And then there's some, you know, subsequent t words in the title. I can't remember it off the top of my head. Um, and so I think the answer is partially yes. And, and the reason being that there's a lot of things that we could do to people that carry a significant placebo effect. So when we say maximize the placebo effect, does that mean that I do all these different kind of like passive interventions that we talked about during the lecture? Do I do all the injections? Do I do all the surgeries that have proven to be no better than sham? Do I do all these kind of things? Um, no, I personally would not advocate doing those kind of things. I don't necessarily think that um, clinical practice, particularly as it relates to painful conditions or musculoskeletal pain should be like an a la carte thing where the patient comes in and says, I think this is gonna help me and therefore you automatically get that done to you. I don't think that that's in pe most people's best interest. If you remember some of the variables that we talked about, how complicated it is trying to minimize dependency and foster self-efficacy and things like that. I think there's an argument to be made. That is admittedly an active kind of area of debate. But when I think about the nonspecific effects of our interactions with patients and our interventions, it's like, I know that if I'm sitting talking to somebody, that's having some of those nonspecific effects. The kind of words that I use, the kind of language that I use, the amount of eye contact, if I can make them feel heard and related to and things like that, all of that is actually, to some extent, gonna have some placebo type benefits. So yeah, I'm leaning into that. But that's just 
being a good clinician, being a good person, right? So I don't know that I deliberately think about that as, oh, in my head, I'm like scheming to maximize placebo, yeah. right? It's kind of like a sociopathic view on clinical, <laughs> clinical no, practice, but, right? But I, but I do think in, in all of that, you uh, are aware of like common nocebo potential. Like, and, and deliberately avoiding those things. Either so. avoiding them or addressing them via yeah. education, mm -hmm. you know? So like the same thing you do with statins with respect to like muscle myopathy or whatever, you'd yeah. probably counsel a patient on that. Yeah. 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 And so I think that, you know, there's other aspects of this too. And this has also been discussed. It may be in that paper that I cited where they talk about, like, think about the kind of, not just your, with your interactions, but the way your office, the way your clinic is set up. If you're in that kind of a situation, what kind of like posters and educational material do you have? Do you have all these like models of spines with like jelly donuts squeezing out of them? Right. That's not ideal to have in this kind of like therapeutic context. And so having more consistent messaging, optimistic messaging around this kind of stuff, um, the whole culture should be placebo favoring. Nice people at the front desk, like at the massage spa that I, that I yeah. talked about. All that stuff, and that's described in this, in this paper, or at least one of the ones I'm thinking of, around how to maximize placebo in the clinical context and, and minimize nocebo stuff. But I stop that line when it comes to actually like doing things to people, the interventions. I'm not gonna deliberately do a placebo thing to somebody or like recommend it just because I think it's gonna have that sort of an effect. Can you imagine walking into a chiropractor's office and it's just pictures of people deadlifting 1RMs, just like <laughs> all from profile, just flexed spines. I think we wanna uh, hire that chiropractor. I 100% do, <laughs> but can you imagine like the general public's response to that? Yeah. <laughs> the good conversation starter, like, yo, I saw this <laughs> video. Yeah, all right, uh, let's see have seen some recent info talking about a uh, low testosterone epidemic. Does the data support such a claim? I do see quite a bit of low T at work, but the patients also typically have a BMI of 30 plus. Can I say something? I'm gonna let you start and I wanna like come in afterwards. Sure. Say you know, the big pharma thing, like doesn't have anything to do with testosterone. No, no one cares about <laughs> big pharma with respect to testosterone. They're like, okay, every other drug besides testosterone, <laughs> I'm anti that, but testosterone seems fine. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I actually don't know what the data says uh, about the prevalence of male hypogonadism um, since like the 70s to now. I've definitely tried to investigate this, but could not find good data sets. I know the problem, multiple problems have arised. Like one, we weren't testing for this nearly as with as near as much frequency as we are now, and the tests that we use have gotten much, much better at accurately detecting people's uh, total testosterone levels. So I don't know if I have a good sense of like how this has trended over a long period of time. My guess would be that as obesity has gone up, as sleep apnea has gone up, as other um, you know kind of co-occurring or even some type, in some sense causative uh, issues resulting in low testosterone have increased. It would makes sense to me that male hypogonadism has also increased. I just can't say that with much certainty. And I don't know that that data actually exists just due to the testing problem. Yeah. Um, the problem among many others is that this conversation, particularly when it comes from people in the strength scene is usually fixated on the idea that, um, there's like this whole male masculinity is in decline and other garbage like that. But additionally that, um, everybody needs to be on testosterone, which is an interesting leap to make, particularly when like in every other context, it's gonna be like deeply, to contrast, anti-pharma, I wanna do everything but get on yeah. treatments and yeah, things yeah. like that. It's like how your bias kind of switches a little bit there, right? So yes, I agree, I wouldn't be surprised if prevalence has increased due to population growth, right? People are living longer, obesity increasing, many other things. Testing, the marketing and, and behind Testing it. and recognition and, yeah. and media and low T clinics off the, off the highway and things like that that are incentivized to rapidly diagnose you and get you on injections that you need to come in for rather than self injections and things like that because mm -hmm. you can charge for all you that stuff. For that, yeah. when I deal with this very frequently in terms of consults that people seek out and telemedicine work and things like that. And a lot of times it's people who are wondering, do I need to be thinking about going on TRT? And the vast majority of the time, it's uh, I'm, I'm going, I'm stopping that conversation when I can and backing up and getting a sense of their general life, their waist measurement, obesity, because we know that obesity itself can drive uh, declines in serum testosterone levels, their sleep, quality, quantity, whether or not you have sleep apnea, um, poor sleep, interrupted sleep, insufficient sleep, all of that can drive those levels down. Um, and then if you have sleep apnea, that can also make it even worse. And sleep apnea un that is untreated 
is effectively what we call somewhat of a contraindication, meaning a reason to not put somebody on TRT if they have untreated sleep apnea. Um, there are many other factors, alcohol use, opioids, um, tons of things that can contribute to this. And unfortunately, and sometimes challenging conversations, people are seeking not, uh, not necessarily down the right path as it relates to what I should do for this. They're like, should I eat way more fat in my diet so I can make more testosterone? No. Yeah, no. Should I take a bunch of vitamin D or zinc? Or I had one guy once who asked if he should be taking boron among other, like, it's like, I haven't thought about that element it's since clearly, I was in undergrad chemistry. It's clearly supposed to be academy. Unaware though. of Not physiologic too. utility. For, for, so people do all sorts of weird stuff when it's like, I think we should try to get your waist measurement down. Nope. We should get you to drink less. Nope. We should get you to sleep better. Give me the injections. <laughs> and screen you for sleep apnea and potentially yeah. treat your sleep apnea. Lame. No. And if we do all of those things, you can go the rest of your life and not need to be on injections every yeah. single week or so. twice a week or whatever, right? But Sounds it's challenging conversations and not as fun as being on steroids, <laughs> effectively, right? Yeah, the deodorant, yeah. Yeah, it's, there's a whole bunch of weird, uh, yeah, we, maybe weird's the wrong word, but just like, myths surrounding TRT. So like, for example, oh, injections give you more steady levels than, you know, like a gel application or deodorant or whatever. And that's actually the opposite. Why do they come out with the deodorant and the gel? Because it's more stable plasma levels. Or like, yo, if I'm on TRT, and even if my testosterone levels are within the normal range, if they're high normal, I'm going to get stronger, more lean body mass, less body fat, better mood. Uh, none of that stuff is actually supported by evidence. Uh, and so even after you tell people all this, you can direct them to sources. You can have compassionate conversations with them. At the end of the day, they really just want to be on testosterone. And if that's the case, why don't you just lead with that? Like if you want to be on testosterone, you want to experience that sort of thing, like lead with that to the yeah. doctor. We're, in general, if someone doesn't have male hypogonadism, we're not going to be like, that's a good idea. But accurately describing the risks and potential benefits of that uh, dosing, how you would monitor this stuff would be a useful sort of discussion around harm reduction if somebody was going to do that. And yeah, we don't really do that at Barbell Medicine. It's not really our business model or, you know, the conversations we really want to be having yeah. with folks. But if that's the case, if somebody's coming into the conversation like, I want to be on testosterone, uh, rather than kind of, it's almost like a Trojan horse. They're like, so I was wondering about TRT. <laughs> and like the narrator is like, he was I mean, not I've had plenty of people TRT. who are just curious about it. They've heard about it. And then when I have that whole conversation, they're like, I get it. I actually don't, I would prefer to not be on injections. Like, cool, then, then we have an understanding. Sometimes people um, are definitely more, seek, more seeking of that. Yeah. And I'm like, well, you can find somebody who's willing to prescribe it if you don't have clinical hypogonadism. If you do, then I can help with that. Sure. The other aspect of this that is worth commenting on is that a lot of times people have sought out testing for themselves and they come mm. in with numbers already. And this is one of the banes of my existence is people getting their own tests that they do not know how to interpret and they come in already kind of with conclusions in mind. And interpreting this stuff is tricky. Uh, making sure it's tested correctly and evaluated correctly is really important. I won't go through the whole sequence of how to work up and evaluate hypogonadism, but there's a whole bunch of physiology that people are effectively kind of clueless on a lot of time. They think that like this snapshot measurement of a blood level tells you everything you need to know. And there's a lot more physiology that's going on. For example, there's differences between people in the sensitivity of their androgen receptors for testosterone. And that itself, if you understand basic endocrinology and feedback loops and things like that, if your androgen receptors are way more sensitive, then based on the feedback, you will naturally live with lower levels because mm -hmm. you have more sensitive receptors. That feedback will downregulate and you'll be happy there. But if you just measure it, we, we don't have a way to assess androgen receptor sensitivity in practice. And so that's one half of the whole lock key relationship between hormone and receptor that we don't measure. It makes it more difficult to interpret this stuff. That's why we recommend testing in people who have symptoms that could be consistent with it. And those symptoms that could be consistent with hypogonadism are not things that are only consistent with hypogonadism. They're things mm -hmm. like fatigue, among other things. So there's always being tested with a bunch of other things. Yeah. I wanna make sure you don't have anemia from a colon cancer that's not diagnosed. Right. I wanna make sure you don't have hypothyroidism. You don't have untreated sleep apnea. You don't drink too much. All these other things that are more often more common, more likely, and potentially more morbid. Yeah. Right? I talked about this in a recent podcast on anemia, where a lot of people maybe find out they have anemia and they're like, I heard iron was good for anemia, so I took iron. It's like, well, never took it a step further. Turns out you have iron deficiency from an undiagnosed colon cancer. I have seen this happen. That's a bad, bad, bad outcome for that person who thinks that they could get the labs and interpret them and manage their own condition, right? Mm -hmm. There's more to this. And so having a guide that you trust, 
who um, has a good understanding of this stuff is helpful. And yeah, it's, it's maybe harder to find somebody like that than I would like sure. for a lot of people. We get asked commonly at seminars, how do I find a doctor who does? I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> we treat each other. Good no, luck. Kidding, <laughs> Word of mouth. It's not easy. Yeah. But, uh, but doing it yourself, um, not advisable. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and just to wrap this up, if somebody does have male hypogonadism and does not have any contraindications to treatment, that would be a very good way and needs to be treated. Uh, to use, you can use testosterone uh, in mul different types of uh, different forms uh, that are available. But yeah, so what I've also had people who have, the plan was just let's take a few inches off the waist yep. and then their testosterone levels normalize, yep. which is also a win. Right. Yep. So, yeah. Okay. Is female stress urinary incontinence a thing in barbell training? Uh, yes, uh, it's not just a thing in barbell training, but really all female sports. Um, this has been studied not to the degree by which I would like, but it's uh, getting there. There's some decent evidence out there on this. Yeah, in fact, uh, stress urinary incontinence, so the involuntary leakage of urine during physical activity in this case, uh, it happens more often in athletic women, women participating in either competitive or recreational sport than women who don't. So overrepresentation here. In barbell training, it seems to be, this, though this has only been studied, I think, in two uh, separate instances, uh, it seems to be even higher than just general uh, athletics, which on some level makes sense just given the loads and the positions and um, I guess the recognition of it happening. Um, you know, if you're running, for example, and you have some SUI, you may not be aware, but if you're on a deadlift platform with chalk and baby powder, creating an ether in the air where everything is visible and there's a spotlight aimed at you and you're pulling sumo, it's like, oh yeah, no, no mistaking uh, what happened there. So it does happen uh, as far as like what to do about it. We did a podcast on this with, uh, uh, Derek's colleague Dr. from Merrill, I think was her name. Dr. Merrill, yeah, from University of Florida, which we kind of go in depth on this. So it's not really a dangerous thing in so far as like if it happens, like bad things are coming down the pike. It's just that uh, if it bothers you, um, or if you prefer to uh, find ways to manage it, there are different treatments, including seeing a pelvic floor PT doing some uh, specialized uh, types of exercises to try to co-contract your pelvic floor while you're performing a Valsalva and, other, and ultimately stop that release, uh, that involuntary release of urine while you're active. Um, interestingly, because I've uh, had multiple clients that have experienced this and they're like, what is it from? What do I do? Uh, uh, so in general, there is a weight um, that you can lift and uh, the squat, deadlift, and, and whatever other exercises you're doing that don't cause this. And then once you kind of exceed that intensity, you've effectively, uh, it's, it's gonna usually happen. And at some level of competition, you're unable to do enough PT exercises and whatever to really change whether or not this is happening. It doesn't mean that it's getting worse or you're causing like this increased risk of bad things to happen later on. It's just sort of outkicked your coverage with respect to the genetic hand you were dealt, your anatomy, and uh, the amount of weight that you're lifting, which is hopefully very, very heavy. Uh, because then, you know, you get to show off a little bit. Mm -hmm. seems, seems fun. So um, yeah, I don't wanna make light of this because I, I definitely feel like a lot of people have uh, felt embarrassment or singled out or uh, otherwise uh, s spoken in an inflammatory manner about uh, and nobody's really doing anything <laughs> about it as far as like active studies investigating like different ways to treat this and barbell training but it is a thing it does seem to happen more in athletic women and even more in strength sports and there's not a silver silver bu bullet here yeah yeah any more, any more you want to add I put that in there knowing that you would have. Oh, that I would have stuff? Sufficient. All right, hold on. While Thoughts we're here, on while we're here <laughs> you ever had a little SUI while you were lifting? Uh, I can't say that I have. Well, let me tell you a story. All right, so <laughs> 2013 Arnold. All right, so uh, we waited at 6 a.m., went to go lift at 8 a.m. And so I was still, I was in the 181 class at that time. So insect. Uh, I had to cut weight for this and I was, you know, trying to get a bunch of fluids back into my system. And the bathroom from where we were lifting was a long way away. Okay. And uh, I did not get to use the restroom before my first squat. 
Uh, the bottom half of my singlet was red and the top half was black. And I wish in hindsight Adidas would have reversed that mm -hmm. uh, because after I came off the platform, I was like, oh boy, that's, um, that's very, very visible. Uh, <laughs> so what I decided to do was take chalk and I all over my legs and I'm like, oh yeah, you probably can't see that because it's chalk. But it turns out wet chalk does look different than dry chalk. <laughs> But this was still, like, Instagram hadn't really taken off at this point, yeah. Probably for the best. Live stream was in 240p, so <laughs> <laughs> nobody was aware of what was happening. Uh, but yeah, it wasn't, you know, a lot, but it was still something. Anyway, okay. <laughs> <laughs> for strength training with general health as the objective, are perpetual hardish sets, RP6 to 7, as effective as harder sets, RP8, RPE8 and more? Did you write this question? <laughs> my, my, if I wrote this question, it'd be even easier than six to seven. RP. Yeah, okay. All right, you want to start this? <laughs> yeah, uh, I think that when people, when, with, with general health being the objective, I care very little about, you know, very, you know, granular differences in intensity or proximity to failure. Mm -hmm. I'm more psyched that, that people are training. I think that the uh, dose that is required to garner health benefits is not very high. Mm -hmm. And then to the extent that people, you know, get bit by the bug and want to make more progress, then that's great. And then we can have that, that conversation. Um, but I'm willing to, for people who are just, you know, active for general health, if they want to train with even lower RPEs, that's cool by me. Yep. I, I have no concerns about that. For strength training, I think there are some caveats here because the question was, are perpetual hard-ish sets, RPE 6 to 7, as effective as harder sets? And I think we have to define what the goal of strength training is here for this person, right? Because it could be, I want to get better at doing one rep maxes. Like, well, if you want to get better doing one rep maxes, as we said in the lecture, you're going to have to do some sets of one, and you prefer that they be a little closer to failure. They don't have to be too failure, right? I've gone very long periods of time without touching an RPE 9 or 10 effort and responded well. That's just my experience. I would not generalize that to anybody else's experience, but to illustrate that it is possible. Um, and so I would do, you know, a single or a double at, you know, a seven RPE or something, and then get a whole bunch of work done way lower intensity, might even be five RPE or potentially even less or something like that. Uh, but I think that needing both of those to drive that top end goal up was necessary. If I had just done the light stuff, the easy stuff, then I don't think I would have gotten the same outcomes at the top end. But if somebody doesn't care about one rep maxes, then you don't need to worry about that either. And yeah. you can probably do just fine staying at, you know, capping stuff, everything at seven RPE. Great. No problems with that. I do most of the programming that I write for, for, for a bunch of my, my folks that I work with. Um, they have not only rarely touched nine RPEs on most things, occasionally some isolation work, um, but probably even fewer eight RPEs than you, than you might think. And uh, people seem to like it because they get on rolls for long periods of time and they feel good, um, fresh, snappy lifts, um, less aches and pains, and they have less anxiety going into their training sessions that's and things the, like that. That's, so that's the big thing. It's cool. It's like the mental, I guess, fortitude that you need to train very near, like close to failure all the time. Yeah. It's so high. If you're like, I have to add weight to the bar. This is going to be heavy. I'm going to take it to the limit. And at some point, you just don't want to do it. Yeah. You get burnt out. And so you run a three week training cycle, have to take a deload. Four week training cycle, have to take a deload. Or you spend this, a quarter of your year deloading. Yeah. Whereas like, this not is ideal. like, <laughs> oh, I can string together eight to 12 weeks, continually making progress, demonstrable progress. Uh, and I also, by the way, do not dread training sessions anymore. And it's like, Man, this is nice. It's easier to view it as just kind of checking the box as part of the bigger process. You're punching the clock. Right. It, exactly. Yeah. Uh, for, let's see, for strength training with general health is the objective, are perpetual hardish sets as effective as harder sets? I'd actually argue that they're more effective. Or at least a better trade-off, potentially. Yeah, so like for the incremental gain of doing a harder set, which I actually don't think there's strong evidence to suggest that to be true, but let's just say there was a little bit more to be had out of doing a set of five reps at RP8 versus five reps at RP7, which I don't think is true, but let's just say, how many sets of five at RP8 can you do before it becomes a nine or a 10 versus seven yeah. becoming an eight or eight or nine? You know, you could do way more volume. Uh, and so the dose the uh, of training you can uh, achieve without, again, out kicking your coverage is much, much higher. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know that I would ever program people to do sets at nine or 10, um, unless we were really getting close to a meet really like isolation exercise focused or somebody really requested it for a short limited period of time. Sure. Yeah. Cool. 
Nighttime leg cramps from lifting, what do? <laughs> you started this. Unfortunately, I did. You, you did this. Turned into a monster. <laughs> yeah. Um, you want to talk about RLS first? Uh, we talked about this a little bit on our last podcast the exercise -associated um, relating to, to hydration. We talked about exercise-associated muscle cramps. And I think that the bottom line is that it's primarily a manifestation of fatigue, particularly in the utilized muscles. And yep. so uh, you know, common recommendations that people have for various forms of electrolyte supplementation and things like that, I can't get too excited about. Really just managing training loads. So you might be, uh, as you've said many times today, out kicking your coverage for uh, some Ding! solid it's a drinking game. Some sports metaphors there. Um, so yeah, I think you're probably just doing more than you might be ready for. And I would back that off. View it almost like a rehab scenario where we have somebody do some training and see how their pain is for the subsequent 24, 48 hours. See if we can get you to train with a dose that does not precipitate said nighttime leg cramps. Um, and then go from there. Yeah. Alternatively, if you can adjust the actual training time, so in general, people who do get nighttime leg cramps from lifting, the times that I've uh, had this uh, come up as an issue with the client has been when they train very close to bedtime. So they basically train, come home, eat, go to bed. Uh, and so if you can do a trial of changing the training around time-wise, you may find out that it's more temporally related, which if you're not willing to change that forever, you know, that yeah. you kind of go back to the same thing, managing training uh, load overall. But yeah, wouldn't recommend electrolytes, wouldn't recommend prophylactic stretching, wouldn't recommend, what else did we talk about? Drinking a ton of fluid right before bed or something like that. Yeah, because even, yeah, so one, it's not going to change your core, your trajectory, but you also you're going to have to get up and pee all the time, yeah. which just seems disruptive. Yep. Uh, yeah, so. That's it. And this assumes, <laughs> and this assumes that it's exercise associated muscle cramps. If it's not, if it's like an RLS type thing, like restless leg syndrome or something, sure. that you'd want to work that up and make sure we're not missing anything. So somebody's like, oh, I just have cramps at night in my legs. And really it's like a restless leg syndrome or other. Uh, and now we're back issue. to iron deficiency and well, colon cancer. It all comes back to that. Yeah, it all comes back to, <laughs> yeah, anemia. All right. What do we need to be teaching the kids of today about health and exercise? Oh boy. <laughs> Why do people come to us for advice? <laughs> <Kids>. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is interesting. I, I mean, I think there's good evidence out there on um, people's attitudes related to food, their knowledge about preparing food, their dietary pattern, uh, and BMI trajectory, for example, on how their parents ate uh, uh, while they were in, um, during childhood. Some of that's obviously related to socioeconomic status and the food environment. People said live in similar uh, uh, food environments as uh, where they grew up. And the food environment today is currently pretty much encompassing the entire environment. So uh, there, there's a little bit of that. Uh, but you would want to have your kids know how to cook, what foods to buy, uh, and have some semblance of how to create a health promoting meal. And I don't know that that level of knowledge is actually lacking in the community. And what I, what I mean by that is if you ask people like what's healthier, like this ultra processed packaged food or fresh vegetables, like in general, people are going to be like fresh vegetables. I think where the disconnect is like not only how to prepare that, but also how to procure it, like how to get it, uh, particularly if they can't afford it, don't can't store it, don't, you know, have the time to do all that sort of stuff. So that's kind of another stickier issue, but you'd want kids to know how to obtain, prepare, store, uh, and can, uh, make a health promoting meal. And then as far as exercise goes, we need to, well, I don't know if we need to teach kids uh, that they need to exercise, but having programs that sort of uh, in, uh, should be more like play increase, age, increase participation part, in. Yeah. So we don't, I mean, we have, you guys, I brought up the term uh, food swamps. Yeah, so it's like physical activity swamps and physical activity deserts as well. There's not places where they can play or be active. And so in addition to having like public programs that increase uh, the opportunity for participation in exercise, uh, also uh, there are even, I would consider maybe like more affluent opportunities. So Pop Warner football, for example, is huge. Hundreds of thousands of kids nationwide participating in Pop Warner football. Why are they not lifting weights? They have the resources. Right, there's a ton of resources there, and you could start. The physical activity guidelines suggest that you know youth should be lifting weights two to three times per week at a minimum. So why aren't we doing that? Why is that not associated with gymnastics, for example, or other youth sports that have pretty big participation? So you'd want to maybe start there and see what lessons you can learn because 
you know, if there's a bunch of money available, you can probably get this done quicker and then expand that uh, uh, further into the community. You don't want to comment on this? You're just, you're just passing? So the answer to that is correct. Yes. Right. However, what I would say is that, I mean, I think that um, I understand that our position in, you know, physicians and we have this relatively broad base of kind of knowledge and just in, in some sub areas expertise, but there's a lot of stuff I just don't know. And so I am unwilling to comment on a lot of things. People might ask me my opinions on like, what would you do with the whole healthcare system? And I'm like, I don't know. I know how to like treat heart failure and lots of other bad things in the hospital. I know how to like have a good conversation with the patient, rehab some back pain, yeah. rule out bad things, come to some you know nerdy esoteric internal medicine diagnoses, uh, among many other things. I know how to train, get people strong, but like some of these things, I don't know. Well, so I wish I had strong, confident, evidence-based opinions on everything, but I don't have much for you. I don't know how to handle no. children. How <laughs> yeah. do we turn them into? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? No, I get Sorry. that. <laughs> well, yeah, I, and I think trying to come up with a policy is obviously beyond our, our scope, but we know some shared goals that would be beneficial. What I think, but do I know that that would like fix the problem? That's oh. like a hypothesis sure, yeah. that we think that those things would All help. Right. I don't know disclaimer, that to be true. Disclaimer you know? to what I just said. Yeah. I don't know that. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough. Remains to be shown. <laughs> yeah. You want to do the COVID vaccine next? Definitely not. Okay. <laughs> we'll, I think we're on like a couple, couple questions left. Yeah, right. When should patients start to consider options like a discectomy or laminectomy when patients have persistent radicular symptoms? Oh boy. Complicated question and similar to the last, so this is relating to the syndrome of sciatica, radicular pain going down the leg. I'm not a surgeon. I don't directly have these conversations with patients. However, I am reasonably aware of a fair amount of the evidence around this. And I think I'll remind everybody from the pain lecture how I described that disc herniations, particularly the more severe they are, the more likely they are to heal on their own with time. So that's something that is important to know up front because it is relevant to decision making around, I have this condition, I have this syndrome, should I get surgery or not? If it is couched in, this will never get better without surgery. Not only is that wrong, but it will also lead people down a particular path, right? So I think that's one thing that could be relevant to decision making. Um, conveniently, there was a paper that was published this past month by Willems uh, in, in January of 2023, titled Variability in Recovery Following Microdiscectomy and Postoperative PT for Lumbar Radiculopathy, that basically looked at all these people who had MRI confirmed lumbar radiculopathy, underwent discectomy and post-op PT, and looked, followed their outcomes over time, and then stratified them into like people who had a great outcome, people who had a medium outcome, not a great outcome. About a third had a poor outcome, about two thirds had a good outcome. If I compare that to a lot of things in medicine, that's actually not bad, yep. right? If I can get a two thirds good outcome with an intervention, generally I'll take it. Admittedly, about a third did not have a particularly good outcome, which is also relevant to decision-making around this, right? Um, and then when we look at other data around time to surgery, this has been looked at a bunch of different uh, in a bunch of different papers around um, upfront, more you know, rapid jump to th something like a discectomy versus more delayed. It seems like things can be pretty good and relatively similar up to about six months or so in like the 24 week range. Beyond that, um, outcomes tend to get a little bit worse, but really not all that, that much worse either. But I think that that's like a reasonable kind of time point to kind of look around as far as, um, you know, People who get surgery done earlier, if they're going to, seem to have more rapid recovery compared to much later than that. And so this is all a bunch of stuff that I'm, you know, I have consulted with people around this who are questioning whether they should get surgery. And so it's like, well, a year or two years or three years from now, I think you're probably going to end up in a similar place, whether or not you get it done. Um, we can go through some some rehab, and if you were will, if this is a tolerable situation for you, and you would prefer to not get surgery, I remain reasonably optimistic for you. I can't guarantee a good outcome to anybody, but I think you'd likely be okay. But you have to put up with this for a while, potentially, and radicular pain is miserable. So do would I blame you if you said, I don't wanna put up with this, I'd rather get the surgery done now, get a more rapid improvement in my symptoms, knowing that my outcome may be similar long-term, in which case I would maybe lean a little bit earlier than kicking it out to nine months, 12 months longer than that that makes sense. So that's like the kind of very general framework to that kind of a conversation. And it ends up being pretty individual because a lot of people come in already with some idea in mind of how willing they might be to undergo a surgery if it's kind of 
on the table. And of course, there are also in between interventions between do nothing and do surgery. And those can also be discussed and entertained. And we have colleagues to whom we can refer like our helpful physiatrists, et cetera, who can, who can, who can be great as well. So um, those are kind of like the, the big picture uh, or bullet points that I would have in a conversation like that. I have no opinion. Great. Yeah, hey. We can move on. All right. Uh, have there been any useful diet slash exercise conclusions out of the biggest loser? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I got you back here. Okay. God. <laughs> Come on, man. Uh, oh, okay. Well, actually, I think the most interesting thing that I have come out of, there have been multiple studies published on the people who've gone through The Biggest Loser. And the most interesting thing that I found out of this is that those who lost the most amount of weight and sustained it the longest to the greatest degree, greatest amount, had the biggest decrease in metabolic rate. And so that kind of, it, it confirms a lot of stuff that has been said over time. Yes, as you lose weight, your basal metabolic rate goes down. As you lose body weight, your basal meta metabolic rate goes down. Uh, we know that to be true. But people will consistently say like, the reason why I am unable to maintain my weight loss, for example, or I'm having difficulties maintaining my weight loss or even losing weight is because my metabolism's actually going down. And it's like, well, if you actually were losing weight, your metabolism would be going down. And so since you're not, it's not and probably not related. You never say that to the person. That's not the point here. Um, but I guess just this interesting confirmation that, yep, if you lose a bunch of weight and you sustain it, your basal metabolic rate is going to be lower. And so that's not probably contributing to the problem as far as like weight loss sustainability. It's just more of like a artifact of you losing the weight and keeping it off. And so if people are having issues losing weight, rather than sort of tell them to try to raise your metabolism, for example. Just close your eyes and yeah, focus. <laughs> manifest a higher metabolism. <laughs> Think good metabolism vibes. Rather we're trying to figure out what is going on with respect to their uh, dietary uh, habits and how can we best intervene there, whether it's through more lifestyle stuff or uh, medications and or surgery. surgery. But that was a really interesting thing that came out. Um, it, it was almost said as an afterthought towards the end of the results and then the discussions like, oh yeah, and by the way, the people who lost the most amount of weight and kept it off most successfully also had the lowest, uh, they had the biggest decrease in their metabolic rate. And you're like, wait, what? Can you go back? Can we talk about that more? Uh, so I thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, anything else that you, from The Biggest Loser? I knew you knew this data better than I did. So. Oh, got your back. Yeah. <laughs> Last two. All right, what personal training struggles have you had uh, at or near your current level of training and how have you managed it? Oh, oh, not like training other people, but like our personal. Our own training, Ooh. our own biggest struggles. Uh, I have a problem with falling off of motorcycles. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's not a problem if I didn't have like meets scheduled in close proximity to uh, colliding with the earth at high velocities. Um, you generally prefer to bench with your humerus in its socket. That's true, yes. Yeah, as it turns out, uh, dislocating both upper extremities uh, within the last calendar year has not been great for my bench. Um, but you know, it's interesting, the, the first time it happened, I was 10, no, nine weeks out from my meet. And so the, it was an interesting opportunity to see like, all right, what's this rehab process gonna be like? And then how quickly am I gonna be able to return to my prior performance level? And so the first day after I did it, I couldn't put on a shirt. Uh, so I had to wear a button down shirt and I was doing it with the one side, pulling it over or whatever. I remember I had a date uh, that night or whatever. And at the end she gave me a hug and I was like, ow. And she's like, what's wrong? And I was like, it's just, it's just my, it's just my shoulder, I'm very sensitive. <laughs> uh, so, and then I think I could bench the bar at like four days post, post dislocation. And then it was like 60 kilos at the end of a week. But anyway, fast forward to the end of the meat prep and at the meet I benched 190 kilos, so 418 pounds, which uh, yeah, it's five kilos off my all time meat PR. It moved pretty quickly. I also did a self lift off. So I was just like, this shoulder's mine. I got this. Uh, I want to hold it. I want to hold it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and so that was like an interesting challenge to overcome because I'd never had an acute like musculoskeletal injury that happened outside of the gym in that close proximity to a meet. And so there's a cool opportunity for me to like go through, you know, feel all the feels, experience all the things. And just uh, that was a cool opportunity. It was less cool when it happened the second time on the other side because I was <laughs> one week out from a meet and I was like, damn, I don't have enough time to fix this. Symmetry though. 
So yeah, well, at least they've both been dislocated <laughs> in the last in the last calendar year. Yeah. So, uh, what about you? Probably just interest. Yeah. Okay. I would say I don't. I have never um, like lost motivation to train. Uh, that's always been something that I've enjoyed a lot. I think just being a lifelong athlete since I was a kid and swimming and lifting and things like that. However, um, we're definitely at points where like one RMs, which is the metric by which this sport is measured, uh, happen very infrequently. <laughs> like if we're lucky once a year, maybe, probably less often than that. And so, um, Pursuing that as the singular goal can become tedious. And so I think finding other ways to keep things interesting uh, has been the challenge. And as we've talked about a little bit before, the method or the strategy is just like moving goalposts around a little bit to keep it interesting in some fashion. And so that might involve different variations that we've not done before that you can set new PRs on and continue to live with yourself <laughs> what, what do you think or so, different rep ranges that you've not hit before what, what's the weirdest PR you think you've hit in the last year um, I mean I was even at a point where I was uh, doing different variations all in the same day and I made like a pseudo total for that training session each week okay and I was like it was like a day where I did like high bar squat reverse grip bench and like a paused sumo deadlift. And it was like the total of the singles at seven on those three different things. And I was like, sweet, I hit a 1600 total on this <laughs> weird as hell combination of limits. So that was like one way or aiming for new sets of 10, which again, you guys know how often those are typically done. I'm, you know, thinking about, um, you know, our, our um, Mikey who does the weird skateboard tricks. Oh yeah. He's working towards deadlifting 500 for 20. So I've got me wondering. Maybe I'll go for 500 for 20. I'm not Wait, that far away do from you that. Think, I think you could do 500 for 20 now. I think so. I've just not done it. Really so sure. that'll buy me a couple of weeks, you know? Oh, I'll yeah, yeah, yeah. Work <laughs> That'll fix <take> something. <laughs> but, so that's kind of the method is just moving goalposts around to different movements, different rep ranges, things like that. So if it's like I'm always super fixated on a one rep max, it's like, man, I got a long year and a half ahead of me or something before, before the stars align and all training aligns and life aligns and I'm not like on call that night before or something like that to actually make that kind of thing happen. So P People just want to see you do super superhuman stuff superhero stuff just lift heavy weights and no one's no one cares about your your weird goals sorry i'm just letting you know that <laughs> yeah just do it on a skateboard yeah you'll be fine <laughs> all right last one my knees are cranky even though i do loaded squats in a variety of ways with no trouble and i have no injuries i get sharp pains from the knees when getting up and down from a chair on the floor is the knees over toes guy let me edit that out later if you want to. If the knees over toes guy uh, onto something with his special exercises, uh, any other recommendations for happy knees? I'm surprised you picked this. Yeah, I think it's worth commenting on. And I'm happy to talk about the guy. All right, do your thing. That's fine. Yeah, go off, King. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think he blew up on the scene and he got kind of amplified by some other people who have like big followings and podcasts and stuff. And so this has been something I've gotten plenty of questions about. Um, I think that he's done some good by D stigmatizing or removing some of the fear from using your joint, using your knees, because that has been demonized in other areas, right? Mm -hmm. Where you don't want to get into your knees too much on a squat or let them go forward or um, forward, you know, knee movement in a squat or, you know, any other kind of activity like that. So he's kind of helped to swing things in the other direction to make it, it, it's kind of to some extent in line with like our friend Greg Lehman's like movement optimism idea, right? Like you can move around in all sorts of ways and it's good and safe and desirable to be able to do these things. Um, I have not personally listened to the way he speaks about these movements. However, hearing from the kind of questions we get, it does make it sound like they are a little bit oversold as being magic movements, very special movements, things like that. And I don't think there's any one movement or any kind of special movement. I just think that we're getting people to move through tolerable ranges of motion, working to improve that, make people less afraid, push into those kind of things. And I'm down with that general idea. Um, I would not oversell any one particular thing. And so somebody in this situation, it sounds like they have some knee pain with basic activities of daily living, but they can squat without pain or discomfort or injury. So it's like, it sounds like that's not maybe helping as much as you would like in your daily activities. So we need probably some more variety in your training. And like I talked about in the pain lecture, as far as something that we often do with people, 
prescribing them silly looking exercises, getting them moving in all sorts of different ways, doing some unilateral stuff. I might have this person do some more lunges. They probably don't do lunges or some split squats or some Cossack squats, some lateral lunges, some reverse lunges. I might put them on a leg extension machine. Whoa. I would get them moving Whoa. their knees and their lower extremities in every plane, in every direction, in whatever tolerable range they could. I wouldn't do that all in one day. I wouldn't do that to RPE 10. I wouldn't do that with super high volume. I would sprinkle it in here and there and see how it's, how it's tolerated and set expectations that this is gonna be a process. It's gonna take time. There's gonna be ups and downs, just like any kind of rehab thing. But I wanna get them comfortable moving in all sorts of ways. I would definitely prefer somebody, I don't really care how much you can squat if you have a ton of knee pain just like standing up off the floor, right? that's not really a way to live. And that's something, that's a thought that has even gone through my own head in my own training. If I have some back pain creeping up or something, I'm like, I could ignore this and keep training, but like, why? <laughs> I would prefer to not live like this if I don't have to. And so I just have to suck it up and take the weight off the bar, make that go away, right? And then train in a way that I enjoy or can tolerate in the meantime, so that I can live my life and not have pain standing up from my chair in my office or on rounds or something like that, right? Yep. Um, and so that's what I would do for this person, mainly say, well, maybe squatting is not necessarily solving this. I'd be curious what your squat program looks like. Maybe it's actually contributing to some mm -hmm. of it in some way. Maybe I need to adjust the dose there and introduce more variety and get you moving in other weirder ways than you ever have before. Yep. Yeah, I think my biggest issue with the particular person being addressed here is this idea like bulletproofing your knees by doing these specific exercises. It's like, yeah, so no, that's not really a thing. Like, and, and selling it as such, again, it, it's just trading one problem for another. Like we don't want to reduce people's pain experiences down to like some sort of damage to the joint or like movement issue uh, necessarily. Uh, and so he's like, yeah, but we're going to bulletproof it and we're going to, you're going to have all this resistant to all this damage that you could potentially incur. It's like, it's the same problem. Just, you just kick the can down the road. So I don't, I don't really like that or like glorifying the Nordic hamstring curl or like any particular type of leg exercise. It's like, there's a bunch of different stuff we can choose from, whatever your preferences are and whatever you seem to respond best to, let's use those things. But, um, you know, I do agree that getting people like swinging the pendulum from like, don't ever let your knees go forward to like, yeah, that's okay. And that's going to have to happen for various uh, physical activities and athletic pursuits. Sure. But again, well, let's not reduce people's knee pain down to like, you know, they didn't bulletproof their knees enough or they didn't do enough Nordic hamstring curls. It's more complicated than that. And I've never heard a dude once uh, describe any elements of like load management, for example, or like these very fundamental principles in like programming, um, particularly from a rehab perspective. And so that's kind of my, those are my, my problems. Those are the recommendations for happy knees, since that was the question. Yeah, load management, <laughs> wide variety of different exercises, make sure not to hyper-specialize in either exercises, rep schemes, make sure you're not too close as far as proximity to failure goes, do your unilateral, unilateral work. And uh, if things are not giving you the results that you want, change them iteratively over time. And if you don't know how to do that, we can help. We can help. Yeah. Cool. That's it. That's it. Thank you guys so much for coming to our seminar.